All right. So for those of who, you who got your ears pierced, I'm curious, why? <laughs> Somebody got an answer? To like add sparkle to your face. Add sparkle to your face. <laughs> I love it. It looks pretty. Cool. Yes. Any other thoughts? Face sparkle, prettiness. <laughs> My mom made me do it. Wow. All right. Um, how old? How old were you when you got your ears pierced? Nine. Nine. Twenty. Twenty. Five. Five. Excellent. Oh, which one? Let's go down the list. What do you got? All right. Gotcha. How about this last question about it? Were you afraid when you got your ears pierced? Lauren's like, uh huh, yeah. Yeah? Ish. ish afraid ish? I can imagine it would be pretty frightening. The whole experience seems scary. Like if you took those tools and put them in, a, you know, like a black and white movie and played some music behind it, you know, it would seem like some horrible torture was about to happen. And really, you're just trying to add some sparkle to your face. Um, <laughs> But there's some, some interesting things about piercing your ears in the Bible, and sometimes actually in the Bible where it talks about piercing your ears, it talks about something completely different than adding sparkle to your face or just doing something because it looks pretty. Check out this little bit from Exodus chapter 21. You guys can turn to Exodus chapter 21 if you want to. We're going to kind of camp out there for a little bit. But we're going to start in verse 2. And it starts out by saying, When you buy a Hebrew slave... He is to serve for six years. Then in the seventh, he is to leave as a free man without paying anything. Okay, now that doesn't have anything to do with piercing your ears. So you might think I'm a crazy person right now. But before we get to the part about piercing your ears, I just want to say something about uh, slavery. First of all, this is not a place where God is saying it's okay to have slaves. Uh, slavery as it happened in the Old Testament, was something that was completely different uh, than what we've experienced, uh, especially in America. It wasn't a racial thing. It wasn't about treating people as property and not as humans. Uh, slaves in the Old Testament and in this passage, when we talk about slaves, were still viewed as people. And in fact, after they worked for six years, they were allowed to go free no matter what. They had a day off every, every week, just like everyone else. And a lot of you guys would be like, man, I wish I had a day off. No, just kidding. You guys have every day off. Um, but they had a day off every single week. Um, they were treated well. And it wasn't uncommon for a slave actually to love working for his master. And, and he would love it so much that even after the six years was over, he would want to stay and continue doing what he was doing. So if we compare this to what we think of normally when we consider slavery, we need to see that this whole passage and everything that it's talking about is completely different than what's normal for us. And God isn't saying that slavery, as we think about it, or owning another person is okay. All right? So just so we don't get hung up on that, he's not saying that it's okay and that you guys should all go out and get some slaves. It's not what he's talking about. Um, all right, so we're going back. Verse 2. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he is to serve for six years. Then in the seventh, he is to leave as a free man without paying anything. If he arrives alone, he is to leave alone. If he arrives with a wife, his wife is to leave with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children belong to the master and the man must leave alone. But if the slave declares, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I do not want to leave as a free man. His master is to bring him to the judges and then bring him to the door or doorpost. His master must pierce his, e, his ear with an awl. An awl. And he will serve his master for life. All right, so other than the word awl being an awesome word, even though it's tiny, it's very cool, um, we can see from this passage that when a slave worked for his master and, and had things going on, if he wanted to continue to work with his master after six years was over, he would have a sweet ear-piercing ceremony. And basically, if he chose to stay because he loved his master or he loved his family, he would go before the judges, and this is an important thing because the judges would be able to determine if the master was trying to coerce him into sticking around and doing something that he didn't actually want to do. Everyone would know when he went before the judges and talked to them that this was actually his own choice, that he wanted to stay and continue to work for his master. And after that, 
after he told the judges, yeah, I, I love my master and I want to keep doing this job for the rest of my life, they would go back to his master's house and the master would take out a big nail or an awl. Why don't they just call it a big nail? I don't know. That's a great question. Maybe because the word all is so awesome. All right. If you say it like that, you'll understand. All right, so he would take out a giant nail and basically nail his servant's ear to the door frame. That sounds gross. Um, and very, very painful. And ultimately, it would cause a piercing or a mark on the ear that would never uh, allow the ear to be the same. Everyone, when they looked at that person, would know this person belongs to his master. This person has made a decision to love and to serve his master for life. And this idea of of making that decision so public and so permanent through this intense, crazy, painful, kind of disgusting ear piercing uh, might be a little bit different than the reasons you guys got your ears pierced, but it's still an ear piercing. And that opening would be important because everyone like who came in contact with this guy would know this man is not his own. He doesn't belong to himself. He actually has a master. And he he at one point had the opportunity to go free. He had the chance to live his own life and, and do anything he wanted to do. But he chose to serve his master. And he chose to make that decision permanent by getting his ear pierced like this. He didn't want any other job besides working for his master because he thought it was the best. And now he was committed to serving him forever, taking care of his master's needs and doing whatever his master called him to do for the rest of his life. In other words, this giant hole in his ear was basically proof of love. It was proof that he belonged to his master and that he wanted to be with him. And that's pretty strong love. Like, you know, for you guys who have been hanging out with each other for a couple days, and some of you guys are like, what's up, girl? And some of you girls are like, hey, you know, to the guys. Like, it, what if escorting stuff happened like this? Hey, I want to escort this person. I want to escort this person. So you go to your counselor, because that's what you guys are supposed to do. And you say, yo, JJ, I want to es escort this one girl over here. And JJ says, really, you want to? He's like, yeah, I think, I think she's the escorting one. I think she's the one. And you say, and JJ's like, OK, all right. Well, you got to prove that. And you're like, uh. Okay, I can do a lot of stuff, like I can do like eight and a half push-ups or, um, you know, I can walk up that hill if you want me to, or JJ's like, no, you guys got to let, uh, let me pierce your ear with a giant nail. You'd be like, um, she's nice and all, but I'm good, right? She's real pretty, but no, right? Um, you wouldn't do it because it's such a strong, strong and permanent thing. It's, it's a love that shows that the commitment isn't something that's shallow. It's not something that's fading. Um, it's saying that you are choosing for the rest of your life to serve and be with this person. Now, could you imagine have, having someone do that for you? Like a person who says, I love you so much that I'm going to make a commitment to serve you and to love you and to take care of you for the rest of your life no matter what. Whatever you need from me, I am there for you. Wherever you go, I will go with you no matter what. I am on your side. And that's what these, these slaves would say towards their master and that's what this commitment was all about and it's such a strong love and what's more incredible than anything else to me and what sticks out so obviously from the Bible is that we have a God that is like no other because even though he is so far above us, he chose to become our servant. You know, it says in Mark chapter 10 that, that Jesus, the King of Kings, didn't come to be served but to serve and to give up his own life as a ransom for us, for many. And, you know, we talk about this passage a lot. It's one of my all-time favorites uh, from Philippians chapter 2. And actually, uh, we talked about it in, in one of the Devos groups last night. And this talking about Jesus, it says, Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. And there's so much that we could take out of that. There's, there's so much that we could consider here. But isn't it amazing to you that God, the one who invented this world, 
chose to give up his divine privileges and take the humble position of a slave for you? That just blows my mind. It's, it's, it's so incredible and so unbelievable, and the love is so strong that it just makes me want to live for God like never before. And, and when, I, when I think about this, I have nothing to compare it to. There's no other love like this, that because God loves me, he chose to leave the glory of heaven behind and become a slave, and he chose to spend his whole life here on earth and ultimately death to help me, to serve me, by paying the price for my sins so that I could escape sin and death and hell and the wrath of God. But the cost for him was so much greater than simply getting his ear pierced, right? Instead of that, he got his hands pierced, he got his feet pierced, and later in the crucifixion, his side was pierced by, by a soldier's spear, and he did all of that to serve us. Listen to what Isaiah 53 has to say. It says, He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrow is acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion and crushed for our sins. He was beaten so that we could be whole, and he was whipped so that we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Just like the pierced ear showed that a slave loved his master, Jesus' pierced and whipped body shows love for you. That he has unbelievable love for you. And this leads us to ask this one question. How do we respond to that? What do we do now? If God loves us like that and serves us like that, what does that mean for us? And I think that 1 Corinthians 7.23 says it perfectly. It says this, that God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved to the world. God paid a huge price to have a relationship with you, to know you, to live with you, to be with you. So don't give yourself to this world. Don't allow yourself to belong to this world as a slave. You know, we all use our life for something or someone. It might be school or friends or popularity, money, success, fun, even addictions, hobbies, or whatever, fill in the blank. We all live our lives for something or someone. But God calls us to respond to his love by choosing to live for him alone because he chose to be a servant for us. And so if you're a Christian, this means that you need to truly follow him. That's not enough for you to go through the motions of, of Christianity. That it doesn't mean a thing. That you can sing loud or you can sing your part right. Or if you know a substantial amount of scripture, that doesn't give you any grace from God. That doesn't earn you anything. What God wants from you is, is your love, your commitment, and your life. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't try and do well in our music, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't uh, try and understand the scriptures more and more. We absolutely should. We absolutely should do these things, but not so that we can get something, but so that we can give something, so that we can respond to God's great gift of love to us by giving our lives back to him. And we need to stop thinking about Christianity, and we've talked about this quite a bit already this week, stop thinking about Christianity as a game or a hobby or something that we just dabble in or something that we grew up in so we continue doing it. You know, Jesus didn't die for you so that you could play a game or have a hobby. He didn't die for you so that you can choose to follow him just because your parents do. But Jesus chose to pay the price for your sins because he loves you and he desperately wants you to love him back. He wants a relationship with you more than, more than you can understand. You know, the way that God loves us is amazing because he understands everything about who you are. Your failures, your feel, fears, your mistakes, your faults, every evil inclination, your deepest and darkest secrets. 
Do you know that God knows all that stuff about you? And he doesn't go, ugh, that person's disgusting. He goes, I love you. I want to serve you. I want to be with you. And I want you to be with me. It's incredible. So if we have a God that loves us like this, we need to live for him. So take some inventory. Look into your life. Are you living for God? Do you actually love him? Are you a person who puts him first? Are you a person who, like Christ, wants to serve? And if today you're someone who says, I'm not a Christian, I'm not somebody who loves God, I'm not somebody who's playing the game, I don't even know what this game is. Today is your opportunity to have an awesome experience, uh, a life-changing moment, to be introduced uh, to the God who loves you more than anyone or anything. You know, even though Jesus, who is perfect, uh, did so much to bring us back to him, he still requires that we turn to him. That we, He understands that, that we need to make the choice to make him our Lord, that we need to love him back, that we need to respond to his goodness and to his grace and say that we want to be his children and we actually want to be in his family and that we want him to be our God. And if you don't know what it's, it is to be a Christian or a Christ follower, to love God and to live for him today, you need to talk to your counselor or to your teachers because there is nothing more impacting in your life. There is nothing more important than a relationship with the God of the universe. Because following him changes everything. And I know that you guys are, like, tired. And a lot of you guys are staring at me like this. Wait. <laughs> and that's fine. I get that it's early in the morning. But please understand this one thing. You don't have time... To wait. If you're someone who's following Christ, don't say, I'm going to make things right tomorrow. If you're somebody who doesn't yet know Christ, don't say, I'm going to choose to follow him tomorrow. Because the life that we have is a gift. And I'm not standing up here saying that, oh no, you could die when you walk out of this room. What I'm saying is, if God really did this for you, if the King of Kings really laid down his life for you, how can you sit here and waste one second, one minute, on anything other than choosing to try and love him back? We don't have time for that. There's no reason to spend ourselves on anything less than the glory of our God, than the one who loves us. And it is really disturbing that in our culture, we've settled for so much less. And it's sad that it's become normal for us, people who say that we love God and that we're willing to do what it takes to follow him and be his people. Isn't it sad that if you looked at our lives, in many cases it would look no different than the lives of the people around us who don't know Christ? Maybe today is the day for you to consider why that is. And I would suggest that it's this. That maybe you've forgotten or maybe you haven't ever really considered what it means for the God of the universe, the creator of all things, the inventor of you, to lay down his life for your sins. It's no small thing. It's no small thing that the God of the universe would do that for you. And yet we sing about it or we talk about it as if it's, you know, old as if it's stale, as, le as if it's lost its power. And if the gospel is, if you feel like the gospel has lost its power in your life, maybe it's because you've, you've lost your grip on the gospel. Maybe it's because you haven't taken the time to consider that there is truly nothing more important than living for God, than loving God, than worshiping and serving God, because our God chose to became, become a servant for us. Do you guys know what I'm saying? 
Yes? If you, seriously, if you have questions about what it means to follow God, if there's something going on in your life that you're struggling with and that you need to talk to someone about, you have awesome counselors, incredible faculty members here, and, and I'm willing to talk to you guys at any time. We are absolutely here to serve you, to help you, and to, uh, to be what you need us to be. Don't, don't hear the gospel and walk away unchanged. Because nobody encounters the one true living God, for real, and walks away the same. He's too powerful for that. He's too big for that. And his love is too strong for that. All right? Let's pray. Uh, dear Jesus, we just thank you so much for who you are. We thank you that even though you are the God of the universe, the King of kings, that you're so far above us that we can't even comprehend it, you chose to lower yourself. You chose to stoop down and pay the price for our sins with your own life. And God, we thank you that even though you are so much more than us, so much more important than us and so much greater than us, you chose to lay that aside and serve us. And God, today I pray for these students that you would show them in a new and powerful way what your gospel is, what the good news is all about and how that should transform our lives. Because when we see that you served us, we want it to inspire us and encourage us and challenge us to love you back, to serve you, and to give more of ourselves to living for you, our God. We do love you, but we want to love you more. And God, we thank you that we can know you, but we want to know you more. So today, help us to consider the gospel. And through your power and through your spirit, please show us what it means to more fully belong to you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.